Hi class, welcome to lecture six, part B. We're gonna continue on our discussion on the election process. We're gonna discuss how presidential candidates are chosen. And that is through the primary and or caucus process. Essentially how a primary works is each state votes for a candidate, whichever candidate each state gets a plurality of those votes, gets that state's nomination. You add up all those states together, whoever has the most primary votes wins the right to represent that party in the general election. Okay, so the primary and caucus process is simply choosing a candidate that will represent your party in the general election, and in the general election, the president is elected. A caucus is a little bit different, kind of a weird antiquated system some states like Iowa and Maine use. Instead of holding a simple vote, they have meetings in each precinct where people actually will attend on one night, will attend and they'll vote until a candidate comes out with um, their nomination. Okay, so it's kind of a weird way to do it. It's somewhat controversial in that voting turnout tends to be lower because you actually have to attend it, uh, the caucus, to have your vote count. So it's kind of a weird antiquated way to do things. I'm not really concerned so much, you know, the details of a caucus election, but I do want you to know that the primary and caucus elections are how um, each party chooses their candidate to represent them in the general election. Um, okay, let's keep going here. So there's two different types of primary elections. Um, most states use a winner take all primary. Some use a proportional primary. A proportional primary is when primary votes for each state are split by a percentage of the vote. And meaning that let's say uh, in California, you have a proportional primary. Um, if you win 40% of the vote, you get 40% of that state's delegates. If you win 60% of the vote, you get 60% of that state's delegates. And remember how the primary winner is chosen is you add the delegates from each state. So proportional, it's split by the percentage of the vote you get in, in that state. Winner take all primaries are a little different. It's whoever wins the majority of the vote gets all of that state's primary votes. Okay, and, and how they do that depends on the party, whether they use proportional or winner take all system, depends on the state and the party. Okay, for example, the Democratic Party uses a proportional system in all the, in their primary in every state. Republicans are a little different. They let the state choose. Some states use winner take all, others use a proportional system. So another very controversial issue, and this is exclusively within the Democratic Party, is something called superdelegates, okay? Essentially, the Democratic Party uses superdelegates to control the outcome of their elections in the primary election. So they have the regular delegates, and again, that's done by a proportional system. If a, Let's go back to 2016, you have, in the Democratic Party, the front runners are Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, right? Normally in a proportional system, Hillary Clinton wins 40% of the vote, she gets 40% of the delegates from that state. Bernie Sanders wins 60%, he gets 60%, right? That's how it, it is done at the delegate level. However, they have super delegates in place that can pledge who, to whoever they want. So in 2016, a lot of people were really upset by this because Bernie Sanders would win a state or even get 30, 40%, but all of those states' super delegates would pledge to Hillary Clinton. Why? Why, do them, why does the Democratic Party have this in place? Essentially to ensure the most electable candidate is chosen. So in 2016, um, most superdelegates thought Clinton had the better chance of beating Trump, so they chose her even though Bernie Sanders won a portion of the vote or even sometimes won the state. So the Democratic Party is often criticized for using superdelegates in this way. Uh, quite controversial. Okay. Okay, so close up this lecture, uh, or, or this part of this lecture on elections. Let's talk about the influence of money in elections. What we know is elections are becoming more and more expensive. So expensive, in fact, that in 2016, I think this is a good example, Hillary Clinton spent $1.4 billion to lose to Donald Trump. Donald Trump, in turn, spent $932 million to beat Hillary Clinton. That is well over $2 billion spent just on an election. 
that is a ton of money. Okay. And as you can see here, represented in this chart from 1960 to 2016, ignore 2016, it's not complete. I pulled this chart from the election was still going on, uh, but I, I kept it because I really like this chart. You can see in a normalized way, adjusted for inflation, how much each candidate spent in each election. So in 1960, again, adjusted in today's money, you see Nixon and Kennedy spent about the same. Um, Kennedy would go on to win that election. And, and you're going to notice a trend here. Usually, but not always, the candidate that spends more money wins. So let's go through each year and see if that's true. So Nixon, Kennedy, Kennedy spent a little less, but he won. So not true in that case. In 64, you have Johnson and Goldwater. Certainly not true in that case. Johnson beat Goldwater despite spending almost half the money. In 68, Nixon spent twice as much as Humphrey. He beat Humphrey. In 72, Nixon beats McGovern, spending you know, twice as much. 76, Carter uh, beats Ford, spending a little bit less. 1980, Reagan beats Carter, spending more. 84, Reagan and Walter Mondale spend about the same. Reagan crushes them. In 88, Bush spends slightly more than Dukakis and wins. In 92, Clinton outspends Bush slightly and Clinton wins. 1996, Bill Clinton crushes Bob Dole, poor Bob Dole, um, spending more money. In 2000, George W. beats Al Gore by spending more money. In 2004, Bush beats Kerry, spending more money. In 2008, Obama crushes McCain, spending almost three times more money. Uh, in 2012, Obama beats Romney by spending more money. In 2016, Clinton lost to Trump despite spending more money. So money does have an influence. Um, but the, amount, the point right here really is that the amount of money spending in, in elections is constantly growing. And, and it's gotten to the point where they're spending billions of dollars uh, in these general elections. Now, because it takes so much money to get elected, not just in, in the presidential elections, but even in congressional elections, it takes millions of dollars. There have been many calls for finance reform, essentially saying limiting the amount of money that can be spent in an election. Um, in 2010, there was a case called oops, Citizens United, which essentially allowed unlimited campaign spending through super PACs. We've talked about this before. So it's one of those things where people on both sides, both parties kind of condemn Citizens United and say, oh, we're spending too much money on elections, but both parties take the money, right? Because they need to, to have a shot to win the election. So until candidates stop taking money, uh, these amounts in elections are just gonna to continue to rise. So alternatively, some countries, in fact, many countries have a limit on what you could spend in presidential elections. For In Britain, for example, political parties are limited to what amount they could spend, and it's government funded. And it's not that much, right? It's you know, a fraction of what we spend, we spend in the United States. So something to think about, would, would our system be better if the elections were capped at, let's say, 300 million or 500 million? Would that be more fair? prevent wealth from buying elections, you know, up to you to decide whether or not, you know, campaign money is unfair or perhaps overly influences elections. Okay, last thing we're going to talk about, this is a class on both the federal government and the government of California. Let's talk about elections in California. And specifically, I want to focus on a pretty uh, unique thing we have in California called a recall election. It's been in the news a lot lately. You've probably heard of it because Gavin Newsom was recalled, although it did fail. Um, essentially what a recall is, is in California, we can remove elected officials from office before their term has ended by a direct vote. And that's in article two, sections 13 through 19 of our constitution. And here's kind of the kicker. You do not have to have a legitimate reason. Anyone can be recalled. And as because of that, every governor is essentially tried to be recalled. But in order to actually go to ballot, you need 12% of, of, of signatures compared to how many people voted in the last government, um, I'm sorry, the last gubernatorial election. Okay. So just to make the math simple, let's say 100 people voted for governor. 
you would need 12 signatures to get that recall on the ballot. Obviously it's much more than that, but let's just make the math simple. So because it's so easy to at least attempt to recall a governor, every governor since 1912 essentially has been attempted to be recalled. It usually does not get to the actual ballot, which it did this year actually. Um, so we have the 2021 recall, it failed. Gavin Newsom remains governor. Not enough votes were received, but we have had an election, uh, a recall election that was successful. And that was in 2003 with Democratic Governor Gray Davis. So Governor Gray Davis was recalled because essentially people felt misled and by the financial state of California and how he was handling our budget. We had almost a 40 billion budget deficit, but some people accused him of hiding that fact during his reelection campaign. So we had a re-election vote. Here's a picture of Gray Davis. Um, those are the years that he was in office and it was successful. We kicked a, a sitting governor out of office in California and a new governor was elected with less than half, 48.6% of the vote, which is for a recall election, decently high because how they do the recall election, if you voted, you'll know, in one section they have, do you wanna recall the governor, yes or no? And then regardless of how you vote in that, the other section will say, if the governor is recalled, who do you want to replace him? And there'll be a list of a bunch of names, whatever one, if the governor is successfully recalled, whatever one of those names gets the most votes, a uh, plurality, not a majority, just the most, will win the election. So technically you could win with 30% you know, of the vote or even lower. So 2003, we voted Gray Davis out of office and a new governor was elected with 48%, 0.6% of the vote. Does anyone know who that was? Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? the, the Terminator. Um, as if having a former movie star wasn't weird. I mean, Reagan was that as well, but wasn't weird enough. It happened during a recall election. Okay, so we do have that ability in California. Again, if you're paying attention to the news, you'll notice Newsom just defeated the attempted recall against him, okay? Um, which goes to show you in California, we very much have a direct democracy. We the people have a ton of power in the state. So that's gonna wrap it up guys for lecture six. Thank you for tuning in and I will speak to you soon.